a contributing worshiper here. Actually, it's not here in this location, but rather there's a building where President Garfield used to worship, which is about a block and a half up the street on Vermont Avenue. It was a very plain and uh, unadorned congregation. In fact, the place was a much smaller building than where we are here tonight. It was located about two and a half blocks from this spot, and it was described in this way. The Washington newspaper described the building in this way. It said it is an edifice of perfect simplicity, innocent of any ornamentation, 45 feet long and 35 feet wide. The pews were of a basic pattern painted a mild brown. By the way, one of those pews is on display here tonight in the mezzanine at the, at the bottom of these steps here. It was the pew where the Garfield family sat when they worshiped in that congregation, and it was the same pew where the family sat on the Sunday before his assassination. Dr. Frederick Power had been called to this congregation when Garfield was a member of the United States Congress. When Dr. Power first saw the church building, he described it like this. The chapel seemed to be well out in the outskirts of the city. And I feel that before any preacher who had accepted the pastorate, there was a hard struggle. The building of a great cause in a great city was such a small congregation and little means and an obscure and unattractive building. That was the building in which President Garfield worshipped. One of the stories that our church tells, which may be apocryphal, is that the carriage driver, President Garfield, was so ashamed to be parked out front of this obscure and unattractive building that he asked and was granted by President Garfield to park his carriage down at New York Avenue Presbyterian Church where all the other carriage drivers were and they would not make fun of him there. After President Garfield's death, there was a great outpouring all across the nation to build a bigger church. And so on July 2nd, 1882, there was a groundbreaking ceremony for the new Vermont Avenue Christian Church, which still stands today just a block and a half across the way from the Washington Plaza Hotel. Occasionally, it was referred to by the press as Garfield Memorial Christian Church. Tonight, we're in a different building. In 1930, the congregation of Vermont Avenue Christian Church became National City Christian Church, which is the building you're in tonight. This unique national witness was on behalf of all the congregations in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And so if you are a member of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, this church belongs to you. It belongs to all of our churches across the United States and it has a national board that oversees its facilities and properties and endowment. Today we are no longer a simple edifice, an innocent of ornamentation. <laughs> national City Christian Church is one of those beautiful sanctuaries in Washington, D.C. in spite of our recent earthquake damage, which you may see above the pulpit and above on the tops of the capitals of the columns that happened in late August. This building was designed by famed architect John Russell Pope, who also designed the Jefferson Memorial, the National Archives, and the original National Gallery of Art building down on the National Mall. On Sunday, we have three services. One is in Spanish, one is in the African American tradition, gospel worship service, and one is in a traditional mainstream type of service that you would find in most Christian churches across the country. We are a multiracial, multilingual, multicultural, congregation that is open and affirming and seeks to be a gathering place for all people, welcoming others as Christ has welcomed us. The two gifts we want to share with you this evening, I hope you picked up as you came in, but if you didn't, please pick up one on the way out. There is this manuscript written by the Disciples of Christ Historic Society president of the time, Willis Jones, who delivered this speech to Hiram College, I think the year was 1961, and it, it's, a, it's a magnificent uh, 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 lecture that he lifts up 
the, the religious and theological underpinnings of James Garfield, titled James A. Garfield, that died in the wool disciple. The other gift that we want you to have tonight is this photograph and description of the President Garfield Memorial Window, which is in the back of our sanctuary in the nave, on, on, on your left and my right. It's uh, not only the photograph, but some descriptions of the, uh, of the window and some of the symbolism behind it. I'm grateful to Peter and Lynn Morgan who made these gifts available for us this evening. But it's my true honor to welcome each and every one of you tonight to this important occasion, Hiram College Garfield Institute of Public Leadership. We want to welcome you to one of James A. Garfield's spiritual homes. And we hope that while you are here, this will be your home away from home and your church home whenever you are in the Washington, D.C. area. Welcome to National City Christian Church. On behalf of Hiram College, I'd like to welcome each of you to this auspicious occasion. It's a real honor to be here as part of our college and to introduce the Garfield Institute for Public Leadership's annual seminar in Washington, D.C. It's so appropriate, I think, that we are here in Garfield's uh, home congregation to enjoy this program this evening. I'm also pleased that we're joined today uh, by a number of our trustees. The chair of our board of trustees, Ken Moore, is with us, as is Bill Recker and Kathy Coleman. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this presentation today. It is uh, really appropriate that we um, commemorate uh, through the Garfield Institute the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Uh, James A. Garfield, as you know, was a major figure in events leading up to that war as a soldier in the war itself, and subsequently as a political leader learning from and taking the experiences of the war and its impact on himself, Hiram College students, the young men from the Hiram community that he took to the war with him, and he made those experiences a part of his own being, his own service, and his legacy as a member of Congress and as a, briefly, President of the United States. We are so grateful to be in this building, and I am so thankful to uh, you, Reverend Gentle, and to Peter Morgan. Two years ago, Peter and I took a tour of this building and had the opportunity to speculate about what a program commemorating the Civil War, commemorating Garfield's role, and hopefully stimulating young members of our Garfield Institute might do. And two years later, that has come to fruition this evening. And Peter, I thank you so much for your leadership and your inspiration in doing this. As we continue to commemorate the Sesame Centennial of the Civil War, I was asked to introduce Dr. Alvin Pesca. I could stand up here and talk about all of his accomplishments that he's had, but I would waste too much of your valuable time and take, take it away from his. But just know that when PBS wants you to be a consultant, that you've done something right. <laughs> so I took a different approach. Last night, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Alvin Pesca and his wife in their hotel room. We talked about a number of things. We talked about state of museums and historical societies today, how they've changed over time, the changes in the preservation of historical documents. And we touched a little bit about President Garfield before he was president, when he was a colonel in the war. I got a taste of what we'll talk about today. But listening to Dr. Pesca talk about his research, I was amazed at his seemingly endless knowledge of President Garfield and the extent of his efforts to write his book, which he simply titled Garfield. Dr. Pesky made it very clear to me, however, that when he chose to write about President Garfield, he chose it for the wrong reasons. He chose President Garfield because he had written extensively. His handwriting was very legible and easy to read, and that he hadn't been written about in some time. 
For whatever the reasons, we are all grateful for Dr. Peskin and his award-winning book about one of the most remarkable men in our country's history. Many of us sitting here today call ourselves Garfield scholars as we attempt to follow President Garfield's intellectual footsteps. However, Dr. Peskin is the Garfield scholar. Dr. Peskin's name is synonymous as the go-to source for President Garfield. I believe I speak for all of us sitting here when I say that I, we are honored to have Dr. Peskin speak for us tonight. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Alan Peskin.
then that career took an unexpected direction. When the Republican Convention of 1880 deadlocked and impulsively turned to Garfield to break the stalemate, he was elected in November by the narrowest of margins and took office the following March. According to John Hay, who had once served as Lincoln's private secretary, Garfield entered the White House as the best trained, best equipped president since John Quincy Adams. It was an unfortunate comparison. Adams, for all his experience, was a flat out failure as president, as even his own grandson acknowledged when he wrote his history. This points up an often overlooked fact that presidential performance can't be predicted by pre presidential <coughs> resumes. If it could, then Jefferson Davis, war hero, senator, secretary of war, would have been far superior to Abraham Lincoln, whose only national experience consisted of one lackluster term in Congress. There's no getting around it. Presidents have to be judged by what they do in office, not by what they did beforehand. By that standard, Garfield is an, is an enigma. In office only 200 days, 80 of which were spent flat on his back as he drifted into death from an assassin's bullet, Garfield scarcely had time to make his mark as president. Yet, even if by some medical miracle he had been able to rise from his sickbed, would he have been entitled to enter the pantheon of presidential greats, or even near greats? I suspect not. And further suspect that such a result would not have greatly disturbed Garfield himself. Neither he nor his countrymen expected or desired their presidents to be great. Their expectations were more modest. Presidents, and even the federal government, were supposed to keep things running, not to make them better. That was a job for private individuals and associations. The proper function of government was to get out of the way of the creative energies of a free people. Except in time of war, the national government scarcely touched the daily life of its citizens. It delivered the mail, it sold public lands, that was about it. Our army was tiny, scarcely 16,000 soldiers on the eve of the Civil War, and not that much after the post-war demobilization. Taxation was light and virtually invisible, consisting mainly of indirect tariff duties paid by the importer at the port of entry, and then passed on to the consumers. The federal government did not even print paper money until halfway through the Civil War, leaving that vital function to state chartered private banks. Presidents and lawmakers were kept on a tight budgetary leash. Unless they were committee chairmen, congressmen were not supplied with offices or even desks, other than the one they occupied on the floor of the House, which kept them uh, in Congress listening and participating in deb debates. Otherwise, they had no place to sit down. Presidents had virtually no staff other than a bar room, messenger, and a few clerks. They even had to hire their private secretaries out of their own pocket. Nor did they have bodyguards, as Lincoln, Garfield, and McKinley so tragically discovered. Lacking the desire, the means, and even the mandate for greatness, the presidents of Garfield's era became fair game for the mockery of later generations, who sneered at his ineffectual, bearded non-entities. 
yet these scoffers may be missing the point. A nation that doesn't need government is a happy nation. And in the Gilded Age, as the post-Civil War generation has come to be called, America was at peace with itself and with the world, leaving its people free to devote themselves to the groups of peace. Little wonder that by present-day standards which absolve executive activism, these presidents rank below average in the presidential performance polls. Garfield, however, along with William Henry Harrison, was usually not even ranked at all due to, due to the brevity of their administrations. His tenure has entered history as a question mark. But in some recent polls, a strange thing has happened. Garfield has begun to move up to the presidential sweepstakes. Coming from literally nowhere, he has surged to a respectable, if not outstanding, 30th place, putting him solidly in the ranks of the below average. <laughs> now I must confess, I don't understand this. If Garfield is to be judged by his accomplishments, then he should not be ranked at all. If, it is, if he is to be judged by his intentions, then he should be ranked high. My guess is that this unsatisfactory compromise derives from the nature of these polls. They are conducted, so we are told, by querying scholars of the presidency. But in fact, there are not very many people who fit that description. Historians, like other professionals, tend to specialize. When they venture out of their narrow, their own narrow field, they have to rely on the judgment of others. We get most of our information by reading other people's books, or more likely, reviews of other people's books. And in the past 20 years or so, there has been a mini boom of books on Garfield, creating enough buzz to convince some historians that there must be something more to the man than previously thought. A similar thing has happened in both in Cleveland, but in reverse. When the first presidential poll was taken in 1948, the participants were still under the spell of Alan Nevin's magisterial two-volume biography. And so they ranked Cleveland among the near great. Decades passed without any fresh Cleveland scholarship, and his reputation drifted lower. Likewise, the ongoing publication of Ulysses S. Grant's papers may be responsible for his moving out of the failure category. I imagine that in the next such poll, John Adams will probably get a sizable bounce from David McCullough's recent biography. So presidents' reputations are dependent upon the vagaries of the publishing world. They are also hostage to the political predilection of the poll's participants. There is certainly no secret that academics are more liberal than the general population. If proof were needed, consider a 1990 poll which asked over 300 historians to state their preference, or what would have been their preference, in every presidential election to date. Except for Garfield and Teddy Roosevelt, they would have supported every Democrat from 1868 to 1988. The only anomaly occurred in 1924 when they spurned both Calvin Coolidge and the Democrat John W. Davis in favor of the progressive candidate Robert Fowler. In the four way race of 1948, 30% more of them would have voted for Henry Wallace than for Thomas Dewey. And to take it but I think it's an even more extreme example. There was a poll that was sort of the height or the depth of the relevance, which asked historians to, historians to rank first ladies. 
Now my comments are very learned, but I don't think too many of them know where Elizabeth Monroe or Abigail Fillmore stood on all of these issues. But they went ahead and complained them anyway. And oddly enough, Hillary Clinton, who had been in the White House scarcely six months when the poll was taken, ranked second behind Eleanor Roosevelt. The last, the bottom of the poll was Mary Lincoln. But just a little bit above her, second to last, was Nancy Reagan. And one suspects that the historians were not judging with total objectivity, but were judging these women on the basis of their opinion of their husband. Now, there's nothing apparently sinister in this leftward leaning, but it does tend to skew the polls towards activist presidents, particularly those who faced and surmounted crises. Those with the good fortune or perhaps misfortune to serve in quiet times are necessarily dropped down gravely. Those presidents who, who boldly do things, even if, as in the case of Andrew Jackson, some of those things may have been ill advised, rank higher on the scale of greatness than others. The highest ratings go to those such as Lincoln or FDR, who successfully surmounted a major crisis. But the crisis, the of the president. Crisis management became the standard of success. As witness Richard Nixon, who entitled one of his exercises in autobiographical self-justification, six crises. But where does that leave those presidents who may have been able to avert crisis before they explode? Presidential greatness becomes a quality reserved for turbulent times. Leaders in quiet times seem doomed to rank as mediocrities. Garfield was elected during a quiet time. This leads us to our next digression, the era in which Garfield lived. Americans have taken to calling the years between Reconstruction and the Spanish American War the Gilded Age. The term is not intended as a compliment. It derives from a satirical novel of the same name by Mark Twain and Charles W. Warner, which dealt with the greed and corruption of the emerging industrial order. The impression conveyed by it and other like-minded novels was that everything associated with a tawdry age, including politics and politicians, was necessarily entirely. Edmund Burke once said that he did not know how to draft a bill of indictment against a whole nation. I should think it equally difficult to indict an entire generation. Yet this is precisely what the standard textbook treatments of the era do. With lurid titles such as The Age of the Spoilsman, The Politics of Complacency, Scandal and stagnation. They conveyed the impression that Ulysses S. Grant invented original sin and that the era which made him its hero was uniquely depraved. That corruption and greed did exist in the Gilded Age can hardly be disputed, but neither can it be denied that these are constant elements throughout human history. Two recent studies by Mark Summers, cleverly called The Plundering Generation and The Era of Good Stealing, amply document the widespread corruption rampant in the supposedly idealistic pre-Civil War decades. And I suspect that an equally diligent search would turn up much the same sorry state of affairs in every era of American history, perhaps if not. The reputation of the Gilded Age may paradoxically have become a victim of the era's success. Since America was at peace with the world and with itself, the corruption, which in more tumultuous times could be overlooked, rose to the surface of public awareness. Yet, during those same years, America bound up the wounds of the Civil War, began the painful transition to freedom 
perform millions of slaves and welcome an equivalent number of immigrants to these shores. They outdo the Romans in a frenzy of construction, building cities, skyscrapers, factories, and railroads that spanned the continent. They tamed the force of light and brought it into their homes and discovered the secret of man's flight, which in the mood of Leonardo da Vinci, they turned the unplowed grasslands of the world's richest interior plain into a breadbasket for the planet. Out of these prairies came the myth of the cowboy, which would captivate the world, and out of the former slave quarters came the music, which would become America's signature. This list could be extended, but even as it stands, it should be enough to absolve the post-war Civil War generation of the customary charges of mediocrity, greed, and corruption. <coughs> Yet it should be noted that most of these accomplishments flow from the unleashed energy of a free people. They are not, by and large, the sort that presidents or even governments can control or direct. Nor were 19th century Americans inclined to allow Washington to oversee their activities. Before the Civil War, this was a country with virtually no government. The war accelerated the process of national consolidation, and centralized power was still looked upon with suspicion. Godfield shared this suspicion. The whole duty of government, once declared, was merely to keep the peace and get out of the sunshine of the people. These ideological constraints hobbled presidential activity. The old civic books maxims on the separation of powers were still taken seriously. Congress passed the laws. The president's duty was to enforce them. Garfield concurred. While it has made the constitutional duty of the president to recommend to Congress such measures as he considers for the public good, he said, it was never intended that he should dictate to Congress the policy of the government or use the power of his great office to force upon Congress his own peculiar views of legislation. Presidents of Garfield say that lack the will to magnify their office. They also lack the means. They were kept on a tight leash. Garfield was supplied with a tiny, bare-boned staff. It goes without saying that he had no press secretaries, no protocol office, no office of budget and management, no resident pollsters, no research staff, no speech writers, no Air Force One, and no interns. Presidents were on their own. They were also still mortals. They walked the streets without bodyguards and chatted with whoever stopped to talk with them. When Rutherford B. Hayes felt like going to Philadelphia to see the centennial celebration, he bought a railroad ticket and rode the coach enjoying a pleasant conversation with the salesman for the next seat. Probably going to lunch. When Chester, Alon, Arthur, I just learned a while back from Arthur's biography that it's pronounced Alon, and so I tried to say that every chance I did. Uh, so that when Chester, Alon, Arthur arrived in Washington to assume the presidency after Garfield's death, he too took a train by himself. Remember, this is the new president. Carried his own suitcase off the train and looked for a cab to carry him to his lodgings. Fortunately, somebody recognized him being a bit. When Grover Cleveland was diagnosed with cancer of the jaw, he waited until Congress was in recess, boarded a yacht on the Hudson River, where he had major surgery in such secrecy the entire episode was not revealed until after his death, many years later. Contrast that with President Eisenhower's many illnesses, during which the public was treated to daily reports on the status of his bowels. 
Chester Lyon Arthur summed up the 19th century presidency to a group of temperance women who were urging it to follow the policy of Mrs. Hayes, who was known as Lemony Lucy by uh, the South, uh, to follow the policy of Mrs. Hayes and banish wine from the White House table. Ladies, he replied, I may be president of the United States, but my private life is nobody's damn business. Nowadays, of course, the president's so-called private life is everybody's business. And first ladies, such as Betty Ford, will even reveal the first couple's bedroom arrangements to Barbara Waters and a supposedly eager nation. Under these circumstances, presidents could hardly become great even if they wanted to. Garfield, however, operated under a further constraint. He liked to clear cut mandate. We sometimes carelessly think of the Gilded Age as a republic of Europe. Yet, in fact, these years were a time of exquisitely balanced party the longest sustained period of two-party balance in our political history. Although Republicans usually held the White House, with the notable exception of Grover Cleveland's two terms, Democrats could draw upon an equally large base of electoral support. Between 1876 and 1896, no president was elected with a margin larger than three percentage points. During those same years, the Democrats controlled the Senate twice and the House eight times. The Republican Republicans, these figures, were precisely the first. For only six years out of the 20 did the same party control the presidency and both houses of Congress. The election of 1880, which brought in Garfield, was particularly close. Garfield's margin over his Democratic challenger, Winfield Scott Hancock, was about 5,000 popular. And the Senate was so evenly divided that Vice President Arthur had to cast the deciding vote. Divided government, as we know only too well today, leads to legislative gridlock. That need not be a calamity. Perhaps the Gilded Age elected is sending its representatives a message. Don't rock the boat. In that case, did it make any difference whether Garfield or Hancock happened to occupy the White House in 1881? Yes, it made a substantial difference. Because even if presidents didn't matter, parties did. This proposition runs counter to the conventional wisdom, which maintains that the two parties during the Gilded Age were meaningless and indistinguishable. Few textbooks can resist quoting Lord Bryce's pointed bar that the Democrats and Republicans were like two bottles on a shelf. Both were identical, and each was empty. Yet, if politics were so shallow, inconsequential, and evasive of the real issues of the day, why was voter turnout? so consistently high. In 1880, for the allegedly meaningless contest between Garfield and Hancock, almost 80% of the voters trooped excitedly to the polls to cast their vote. This was not a fluke. Virtually the same level of presidential participation, of voter participation, can be seen in all the presidential contests of the Gilded Age. Contrast that to the depression quantum election of 1832, when we were sure, when we are assured genuinely important issues were at stake, but only 57% of the electorate bothered to vote. A comparison with recent presidential elections, when barely half of the eligible voters show up, is too embarrassing to consider. Clearly, the voters of 1880 must have thought that that election touched some vital interest. And who were we in our ex post facto wisdom to tell them that they were mistaken or deluded? They understood what we have forgotten. 
that there were fundamental differences between the Republican and Democratic parties. Most significantly, the Republicans were the party of the Union, while Democrats, for all their squirming, could not completely shake, shed the taint of their past association with secession and rebellion. Democrats brazenly advocated white supremacy. Republicans, despite occasional equivocation, still maintained some commitment to the security and eventual equality of the freedmen they had helped liberate. Democrats favored inflation. Republicans supported a stable currency. Democrats won the values of an agrarian past. Republicans anticipated the industrial future. In these and in other ways, the Republicans, with their inclination towards nationalism, industrialism, and egalitarianism, were aligned with the most vital movements of the era. They could even be considered, contrary to the widely held stereotype, as the more progressive of the two major parties. It was to these parties, not to the candidates themselves, that most of the voters gave their allegiance. The candidates, in fact, were not even expected to campaign. It was considered unseemly for a man to push himself for the presidency. Self-promotion might be legitimate for lesser offices, but a would-be president was supposed to rise above such vulgarity. He was to model himself after what one historian called the reluctant tribute, similar to that noble Roman Cincinnati, Cincinnatus who accepted supreme power reluctantly and only at the urging of the populace. Candidates who violated that rule did so at their own peril. Or as really James G. Blaine, Winfield Scott, and William Jennings Bryan all campaigned to one degree or another and were punished for their presumption by the voters. Garfield's sole function, advised Rutherford B. Hayes, should be to sit cross-legged and look wise until after the election. It was not even considered proper for candidates to appear at the convention which nominated them. Although Horatio Seymour, Bryan, and Garfield did attend their nominating conventions as delegates, they still had to go through the quaint charade by which a nominee was not even allowed to acknowledge the status until officially notified a week or so later. There'd be a knock on the door, a delegation would appear and say, Sir, your party has chosen you as the, uh, as the standard bearer. He was supposed to say, even if his Garfield did, he was at the convention himself. He was supposed to say something like, Who oh, me? I am not worthy. And then pull out a speech of acceptance and then read it. FDR was the first to break with this convention and accept the nomination in a speech before the assembled convention. This is not to suggest that candidates took no part in the campaign other than to carry the banner of the party. Garfield played an important behind the scenes role by mollifying parties, various factions, and by devising the winning strategy. He also invented an ingenious technique which has been called the Front Porch Campaign, which enabled him to campaign without appearing to do so. Although he stayed at home in Metro, Ohio, cultivating his farm in well-publicized, rustic simplicity, each day's train brought delegations of well-wishers anxious to pay their respects and to hear a few well-chosen words time to make the evening paper. More importantly, Garfield's winning personality, his union war record, and his unmatched knowledge of public affairs garnered from his 17 years of service certainly helped persuade a majority of the voters that the nation would be safe in his hands. Did he live up to that trust? This brings us back to the short answer offered at the beginning of this talk. It's difficult to evaluate an administration of only 200 days, during 80 of which the government stood still while the wounded president drifted towards death. No 
war, with the first 120 days, when Garfield was healthy and active, particularly noteworthy. Since only the Senate was in session at that time, in order to pass on appointments, no legislation could be proposed or enacted. Much of the President's energy was expended on a seemingly unedifying patronage squad, which tore the Republican Party apart and threatened to break up Garfield's cabinet. He did manage to surmount that crisis, and in so doing, he strengthened the office of the President in relation to the Senate, and at the same time weakened the influence of the backward-looking obstructionist stalwart wing of the Republican Party. That victory behind him, he was ready to turn his attention to more substantive matters of policy, but he was cut down by two 44 caliber bullets from an unhinged religious fanatic. Not the disappointed office senior, as the customary phrase would have it. Given that abrupt and untimely conclusion, the Garfield administration was fated to enter the history books as a question mark. Even so, it should be possible to construct the outlines of what Garfield might have accomplished had Charles Julius Mateau been a poor shot. In foreign affairs, Garfield would undoubtedly have given the Secretary of State James G. Blaine a free hand in pursuing this Pan American policy, which was designed to reorient American foreign policy from its traditional ties with Europe and cultivating closer, closer bonds with what we would call today the Third World. Whether that new departure would have made much less of a difference is doubtful, considering that when Blaine did get a second chance to pursue that policy, during the Benjamin Harrison administration. A uh, little thing of it. In domestic affairs, Garfield was planning, even at the moment of his assassination, literally the moment he was talking to, uh, to the Secretary of State at the railway station about the subject of the new shop. Uh, he was planning fresh measures to reconcile the White South to the rest of the nation while maintaining black rights and opportunities. His solution, as was befitting a former college president, would have emphasized education, possibly financed by the federal government. Civil service reform was also on his mind, although this scheme fell far short of the Pendleton Act, which would be signed by his successor. These may not seem like having made accomplishments, by our present-day yardstick of crisis management and legislative achievement, the presidents of the Gilded Age, including Garfield, come up short. But maybe we are using the wrong yardstick. <coughs> to turn Lincoln's admonition around, it might be that the dogmas of the stormy present are inadequate to the quiet past. It's easy to mock these 19th century political leaders as empty figureheads, like the puffed up image of the great the powerful odds. Yet such a supercilious dismissal fails to explain a final phenomenon of the Garfield administration. The unprecedented outpouring of genuine grief that swept the nation following his death. That drawn out death march, the most widely reported and closely followed peacetime event American history up to that time created such intense public anxiety that when the end came, it, it exploded in spectacular displays of public mourning that for the moment erased party and sectional divisions. Tens of thousands of people lined the path of the funeral train that carried him to Cleveland. When he passed through Princeton, the students came out and threw roses on the railroad tracks. Weeping citizens could be seen for hundreds of miles. Why would Americans mourn Garfield's passing so deeply if these Gilded Age presidents were as insignificant as has been claimed? Why, did, why was such emotion expended over the loss of a president? They barely had time to know. The answer is that they did know him. And what they knew 
explained why they had elected him. During the presidential campaign of 1888, the outline of Garfield's life story, suitably mythologized, had been drummed into the public consciousness. They had learned how a poor boy rose to leadership in peace and war by hard work, native wit, and manly pluck. Relying on the lessons taught by his widowed mother, his rustic school house, and the church of his choice. In his life and personality, Garfield could be made to encapsulate many of the most cherished symbols of the American dream. Above all, the country would most cherish the values which seemed to be threatened by the changing, unpredictable new era which was beginning to dawn. In this respect, Garfield's brief administration represents an aspect of the presidency which cannot be measured in the traditional standard of bills passed or concrete actions taken. It serves to remind us that the institution of the presidency is more than an administrative or even a political one. It also, in a sense, touches on the sacramental. The president can personify the values and aspirations of the people and provide a visible embodiment of what Lincoln once called the civic religion of the nation. This is not a rule that can be neatly measured by the charts and graphs so beloved by current practitioners of political analysis. Nor can it be conveniently factored into polls measuring various degrees of presidential greatness. Questions of greatness aside, then, what sort of president would Garfield have been if he had been spared? There are too many uncertainties to give a definitive answer. We certainly cannot say confidently as Fortinbras said of Hamlet, he was likely that he had been put upon to prove his loyal. Still, it does seem safe to speculate that at the very least, he would have remained true to his own standards and to the expectations of his time. And that, I suspect, would have been enough for him and should be enough for us. Thank you.